This is Mizuki Ravendale here coming at you with part 3 of Corpse Party Blood Jar to end today. We're going to be starting chapter 1, so if you like the video, make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And hit that notification bell as well. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started with good old chapter 1 here. If it will cooperate with me. I don't know why it... Stuff's been weird on my computer today. Come on. Hold on, let me. I'm trying to make sure this works properly, so a little technical difficulties at the beginning, guys, but that's fine. Nothing new over there with that. Uh, there we go. Oof. Jeez. Day has passed since the events of Shuramanjaku South Apartments. This was to be a significant turning point for me, and Mochida might have been a part of it from the start, except that fate seemed to have other plans for him. Like another trainer, Puppy Kuan gave him a strong glare and held up her index finger in reprimand. Uh oh. Oh dear. She seemed a little taken back by that remark, puffing up her cheeks like a chipmunk in protest. We could both be amused to guilty motion to try to get up and leave his seat in one swift motion, but he was quickly and easily caught, lifted up, and forcefully sat back down. Oh, damn! Miss Kuon was smiling. She was actually enjoying this. Miss Kuon was only the slightly spit taller than Mochida. This didn't make her taller than the average, but her arms were small and frail. There seemed to be no way she could possibly have lifted someone up his build. This whole situation was rather bewildering for him, and he made no attempt to hide his confusion. He had no other option. Apparently, he was going to be studying algebra for the next hour. Come hell or high water. Meanwhile, at a local cafe near the school, Kishinuma and I were sitting down to speak with Aiko Niwa, the informant who'd led my first to be the previous night. I responded with a dismissive gesture while continuing to rub my abdomen with my other hand. Ever since the previous night, I've had this constant unbearable urge to pee. Oh dear. tilted her head and stared at me, looking me up and down, seemingly judging my every mannerism, my every moment. It was making me feel really self-conscious. I covered my abdomen with, with both hands, as if guarding it from her gaze. Kishinu and I stared at one another, still unsure how to feel about this strange new addition to our entourage. <laughs> we 
we pledged to never discuss the Heavenly Host with anyone else, which we'd always assumed would be an easy promise to keep, but now, casually and out of the blue, here we were. Oh. Well, in case you knew when I were speechless, I just sat there staring at my palm subconsciously trying to see my aura, I guess. Iko was smiling at us triumphantly. Oh dear. The true source of the deaths and subsequent erasures that had turned our lives into a living nightmare was the Sachiko Ever After. Ritual posted on Naho's occult blog. Been a fan of Naho's for quite some time, so when I saw that, I knew I had to try it out with my friends from Class 2 9. And as a result, half those friends were now gone. Dear, what their oh, physically, Aiko was a very attractive young lady, but personality wise, the jury was still out. Her words were calculated and emotionless, her true intentions a mystery. Oh boy. Oof. Oh dear, that uh. Oh. I looked down as I answered. Despite everything she'd done, Mary Naho's passing was still painful for me. She'd become one of heavily host lost souls and gone completely berserk in the end. I was the one who finished her off. Uh oh. Aiko seemed completely unaffected by this revelation. Her tone remained even and her expression cold and distant. What the heck? Honestly, I'd had about enough of her by this point. She was so devoid of empathy, it was almost offensive. I was generally starting to get pissed off. Oh dear. Kishi knew my continued to stare intently at Aiko with his own brand of cold, emotionless eyes. He was oddly quiet, though his anger was palpable. I clenched my fist. Oh boy. Aiko showed us a photo of a girl named Sayaka Oe. Oh. Aiko's expression was so unfaltering. You could carve it in stone. Couldn't take any more. I had to say something. My voice was breaking with rage, but even if that hadn't been the case, my face must have read like a book. This icy bitch may have had only one expression, but I sure didn't. Oh boy. I had no idea what to say. It seemed like Aiko was used to this sort of thing. Her response felt carefully rehearsed, like a 
Sales pitch. Finally, Keisha Numa broke his silence. She ain't wrong. Oh, shit. Her expression remained calm and collected overall, but her eyes blinked several times in rapid succession. That was the first outward sign of emotion we'd see from her. Echo quickly shrugged off her sudden outburst and was back to her usual icy self. Awkward tension filled the room, or at least our table. I felt the goose, the thick, hard bound file folder from the light blue bag she brought with her. She opened it to reveal several documents of a questionable nature. Among them were what looked to be a family tree, as well as numerous pages featured black magic symbology or images that looked like the tree looked like tree branches. I was looking directly into my eyes now. Her gaze was fixed, intense, and unblinking. Oh, boy. Who oh, that photo on the table? It wasn't the clearest of pictures, but there was no doubt that the location it depicted was Heavenly Host Elementary. The miniature small girl could be seen standing in one of those all too familiar hallways holding a hatchet in her right hand. Oh boy. Can't even describe what was going through my head at that moment. I felt like I was about to burst. I could have remained calm as ever while recounting her story. I'm a keenest futon. Inside were apparently two stones resembling Magatama, Kalma shaped ceremonial objects from Japanese antiquity. Also included in the box were silver, more roughly hewn stones, as well as a lining along the edges consisting of crumpled pieces of thin white paper. They looked almost like a demented version of yin, yang, yin and yang symbols. Puzzle pieces that were clearly built to be slotted together. Falco now had one stone in each hand and was motioning them toward one another as if to drive that point home. She knew when I briefly left the ice again, we shared the same look of bewilderment. Aiko's personality is much more twisted than either of us had initially perceived it to be. (laughs) 
At this, she produced an old instant camera and placed it on the table in front of us. Oh dear. I examined the photograph in greater detail and a chill ran down my spine. There was absolutely no denying what it depicted. I was actually shaking. Oh dear. I can almost your torch photo in my hand. The answer was beginning to dawn on me. A sudden cold sensation explored through my body and I shudder as if trying to shake off the enroaching realization. He should have only for the conversation was currently beginning to engage him a lot more than it had been. Oh boy. Game for us for a second. Hold on, guys. God dang it, game. I think it's being sold from where it's raining right now. There we go. Why? How could she know about that? A million thoughts, a million questions were running through my head. I was speechless. All I could do was sit there and hear her out. Look, I'm up with screen hormonal agony. The sounds you make when you want to make a sound but are barely able to. That one was a little more forceful, accompanied by thrashing. It caused the nearby table light to fall over and roll along the ground. This was Yoshi Shinozaki's clinic. And Yoshi herself was on top of her husband, holding him down with both of her hands. She continued her Shinto purification chant. To prevent Seiji from biting off his own tongue, he had been gagged with a towel. Needless to say, he wasn't looking particularly well. Not far from where this was occurring, Sachiko stood aghast, trembling as she watched the proceedings with hesitant sidelong glances. Seiji still collapsed on the floor, was clearly suffering. His body was bent into a most unnatural shape. He was fervently clawing at his neck. Sachiko's fire screamed through his gag. Foam began to forth at, froth out from the edges. He was going into cyanosis. Ghostly Yonja Shinoshaki went from ages past mouth down upon the event from the ceiling laughing and mocking his suffering. Worse still, some of the women had traditionally blackened teeth giving their swallowing an unintentionally sinister edge. 
The atmosphere within the room was heavy as the spirits occupied every empty corner, dancing and flitting about freely and joyously. Tachi's body sharply bent and began convulsing. Her great grandmother, Sarah, the head of the Shinozaki family, was among the black teeth women laughing joyously at Seji's suffering. Oh boy. <clears throat> his voice began to weaken and his convulsions began to lose shape. Only the last spark of life had left his body. His eyes rolled back into his head and all movement ceased. Sachiko looked up, eyes glazed over with tears. Yoshi too was stricken with grief and despair. Damn, that sucks. Uh oh. Aiko stared deeply to my eyes, seemingly fishing for a reaction to her tell. I continued listening, unknowingly stroking the wound on my thigh as unpleasant memories of my own foolish running with black magic resurfaced. Ow. Oh. I so we knew what she was going to say. I knew that all too well. Just like Yoshi, I'd experienced my own tragic failure with black magic at the Shinosaki Clinic. collapsed onto the floor, violently thrashing about as the weight of an entire dimension crushed her from the inside. The exaction has saved her mother's life, certainly, but death would have surely been preferable picking herself up. Yoshi rushed to her daughter's side in tears. parents how we're bawling pain mixing with relief mixing with pain again Aww. little girl burned her face at the Yoshi's bosom and just cried and cried Yoshi grasped her tightly in both arms tears streaming down her face uncontrollably 
By this point, Sachiko's body had begun producing a dark blue aura. took a big noisy sip from her coffee mug. God dang it. Game stop freezing! Okay, there we go. Game fix itself. Let's go. Probably because the school has decided Sachiko's violent demise that her nirvana took on its form. That is understandable. Still down. This was all starting to make a sick sort of sense. The pieces were falling into place and painting an absolutely awful picture. I shuddered to myself as I considered it. This entire conversation was a roller coaster of emotions for me. At this point, I was just angry. Angry at everyone involved in this whole ordeal, myself included. Oh, boy. That certainly got our attention. We both perked our heads up immediately. Oh boy! There's a spell of revival? What? Nakashima and I knew that one all too well.
Uh oh. Kishino seemed a bit more confused than he probably should have been, though I suspect the look on my face may have had something to do with that. I performed that spell. The very one Aiko was describing when it took hours, failed measuring, killed my sister all at once. The guilt returned. Lord, my head solemnly. Aiko grinned at me, and I had the sneaky suspicion it was because she somehow knew what I was thinking, though I couldn't be sure, and I certainly didn't know how she would. I didn't exactly mean to interrupt Kinoshima, but quite honestly, I didn't even realize he was talking. I was too focused on what Aiko had just said. Aiko tilted her head at me, the same wry smile creeping across her face. She'd gone from cold and emotionless to knowing and expressive in a mere instant. to play through the first two games I did. Yeah! I could point to the scar on my neck then went one step further and lightly brushed it with her hand. I could feel that touch deep within my soul. I suddenly found myself swallowing my next breath practically choking on thin air. I looked down again, trying my best to avoid Aiko's gaze. I almost, almost said glaze. The heck? I meant gaze. Dang. When had I started crying? I raised my head again, intent upon looking deep in, into Aiko's eyes as she answered my question, but she looked so blurry through my tears. I could tell, though, that she was smiling at me. It was that same expression, her new standard. Aiko patted my head as one of my dogs after a successfully performed trick. The heck? My confidence was begin was being bolstered by the minute, though in retrospect that was likely Iko's aim. Nonetheless, if there were still something I could do for my friends Aiko once again placed the bluish white magnetic stones from the box. I had this time putting them together, though not quite the way they were supposed to interlock.
I leaned forward to spite myself. The name sent a shiver down my spine, but now that I had heard it, I had to know more. Waiting on the game again. both flinched at her chant, but Aiko just smiled. She must have intentionally oriented the stones the wrong way so the charm wouldn't activate. If this keeps uh, doing what it's doing, I'm gonna. Uh, I wish it would stop doing it though. I don't know why it's doing it today. I think it is because of the dang rain. She tossed the stone she'd be holding in her right hand into her left, where it clacked together with the other. gazed longly at the stone. She was clearly utterly enamored by them. It seemed as if they were the key factors in unleashing her newfound emotional expressiveness. But my focus was elsewhere. Without a doubt, the items Michael now held in her left hand were extraordinarily dangerous. Possibly the most dangerous horrific object in the entire world. However... Aka was ogling them with her left hand. Her right was feeling around for something in her breast pocket. She slowly removed it, producing an old black and white photograph. When had she taken that? It was the same photograph I'd seen at the Makina Shinozaki's house the previous night. Depicted a young Yoshi alongside her mother and Makina. Tubas. Never heard of these terms before at all. And then there was that damn book of shadows again. Why did that have to keep coming up? She thrust the Ever After Stone toward me triumphantly and continued to make her pitch growing more excited by the second. I was legitimately speechless, what can I say? Oh boy! Uh, well, yeah, true, but still, uh... Oh dear lord. No! 
Chino and both reacted to this preposterous suggestion with a start. She couldn't possibly be serious, could she? What could she possibly have been thinking? I wanted to stop her at once. I wanted to take those stones and break them right there on the spot before anyone else got hurt. But I... Aiko leaned in as she spoke, her breast scented with the sugary sweetness of the extravagant desserts we'd been eating tickled my nose. Oh dear war, we gotta go back. Echo seemed like she was on top of the world, but that just made me all the more disgusted with her. On the other hand, she was offering me a chance to save our lost friends, and however remote that chance may have been, a stack the odds frustratingly in her favor. Still couldn't just say yes, but also couldn't say no. Honestly, I resented Aiko for putting me in this position. I glared at her for a moment before I said anything. I'd almost forgotten Kinoshima was there. Sudden waves of guilt washed over me. He had an absolutely ridiculous Incredulous look on his face. I couldn't bear to see it, so I looked away. Oh. Aiko smiled. She oriented the two stones so they form a perfect yin yang symbol, and then slotted them together once again. Immediately, the stones began glowing with a bluish white hue, and a stream of energy started to form around her. I go get you a spell and look directly into my eyes. She slowly separated the two stones as she said this. The energy surrounding her dissipated. Oh boy. Kishinuma didn't wait for an answer. He grabbed the after after stones from Aiko's hands and began examining them carefully. seemed taken back by the question. Way to go, Kinoshima. You managed to catch her off guard. I go seem to ponder these words for a moment. Kishinoma popped one of the stones in my hand and slipped the other back into the drawstring pouch Aiko had brought them in and closed it up. He then casually handed the pouch back to its rightful owner. Aiko flashed just the biggest, most gregarious smile. I think I've never seen. Closed my eyes and gave something like a half-hearted, half nod lower in my head without raising it again. It was interpreted as a yes, but I'm not sure I meant it that way. Aqua got up and grabbed the check. 
took out my wallet. I had no desire to owe this person anything. Aiko just smiled. Aiko handed her photograph to me. Oh boy. As if he went for this cute key, she knew I pulled the other stone from his pocket. Damn, Yoshiki! Turned my gaze up to meet Kishinimas. My eyes must have looked like this looked like saucers. Windows into a mind full of worries. I disappear spurred by this unexpected turn of events. Kishima patted me on the head reassuringly as he said this. And I had no idea how to react. That warm is safe, but also a little annoyed, much like a younger sister being in simultaneously comforted and scolded by her big brother. All I could say in response was I feel my eyes still bulgy from my head opened as far as my eyelids would allow. I imagine how I must have appeared to Kitoshiba and was momentarily embarrassed embarrassed. Blech. Is there a way for me to save? Uh, remember up these stairs with some Mayu Sazumoto. At the time, it never dawned on me that the logistics of those berries could ever be called into question. Why would it? When you graduate, transfer, or get married, you're always still able to see one another as long as you're both alive. But in this reality, it's a, as if Susan Model never even existed. Is there a candle? Where are all the people? The streets seem unusually quiet. Is it just because of the late hour? If I recall correctly, there is a candle here somewhere.
I think. Okay, I think I gotta talk to Yoshiki. What is he thinking? That boy needs to needs a boot to the head, I swear. <laughs> boot to the head. Uh yep. Come on then, let's go. It's fine. Tokyo Mac was displayed on a television screen marked with two red dots. The marque at the bottom provided the headline. Some of violent deaths remain unexplained. Uh oh. Not thinking, I'd left the socks I just removed from my feet on the living room floor and began walking toward the bathroom. Oh, God dang it, Gabe! Uh-oh. It's doing the whooping music. That's never good. Uh-oh. <laughs> that is never good. Uh-oh. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, yeah, got taken at Yumi. This was a bad habit of mine, so ingrained within me that it had almost become a ritual. Mom did well to have caught it so quickly, I grabbed my socks and left the room. Set my bag down in my room quickly and automatically, grabbed my sweatpants and spats, and made a beeline for the bathroom. When I got there, I threw my socks into the hamper with purpose. Then I began peeling off my school uniform. As I observed myself in the mirror, I began to murmur. Those burn marks on my neck and arms were internally reminders of what I'd been through at the Shinosaki estate. I could clearly remember the agony I went through as they formed. I remember watching them sear into my flesh out of thin air, blood spurting from them as if I'd been knifed. I only survived because Hinoe sacrificed herself in my place. Tried to force self-confidence into my expression when it wouldn't come. I slapped my cheeks hard. It was in me somewhere. It just needed to be yanked out into the open. I lowered my head into the water ever so lightly, blowing bubbles in the water with my mouth. The pros and cons of returning to Heavenly Host were racing through my head. Forgot how long the beginning of this chapter is. Oh my god, this guy! This was just about the last thing I expected. I couldn't help but scream. It was that same boy who'd found his way into my room last time wearing the exact same clothes. He spoke to me without once turning his head to look in my direction. He 
He smiled, still facing away from me. It was a confident yet sinister grin. It had been a res as fire by this point. My head pocket was now housed. It now housed all the blood from my entire body. I matched myself wise a sheet below the neck and flashing right above it on the verge of a megaton explosion. Good lord. He handed me the sonograph from Ico. I grabbed the photo from his hands as aggressively as I could muster, then backed away slightly, putting as much distance between me and him as humanly possible. It's definitely the same picture of the little girl holding the hatchet that Aiko had shown us earlier, but I now noticed that she was holding something in her other hand, too. It was a hardbound book around the size of a typical desk dictionary. Though I could barely make it out, there was a certain aura to it that looked like an awful like like face. He stuck out his hand and pointed directly at my face, then slowly lowered it down towards my abdomen. He was now explicitly pointing at my lower body, but as soon as I started to get self-conscious, he flipped his hand over and opened it, exposing his palm. There was another piece of tin yen gum cup there, the same kind as before. I'm not sure why I took it, but I did without even thinking. As soon as the exchange was made, he immediately turned toward the bathroom window, apparently preparing to make his escape. My question seemed to stop him in his tracks. Wasn't about to drop my guard, especially given the obvious advantage this boy had over me. But he didn't seem like he'd come to attack me or anything. Rather, it was almost like he was trying to lead me somewhere to show me the way. He turned his head towards me just enough that I could catch a brief glimpse of the eyes beyond his hood. They were icy blue in color, but gentle and sincere. He smiled once more as he leaped out the bathroom window. I was kind of dumbfounded. I had no idea how to process what had just happened. Mom barged into the bathroom right as she could burn. It was probably the first day she could find it, which fed off the potential tourists. Too bad she hadn't just been a moment quicker. All I could do was squat on the bathroom floor and stare at her with hollow eyes. There was no way to adequately explain any of this to her. <laughs> it was late at night and I still hadn't bothered changing out my school uniform. I needed food, though I decided to hit up the convenience store on my way back home. I picked up a bottle of olives, a pack of tofu, some mineral water, and other various things to keep me going for a while. Get 
hardly believe it. There was actually an occult section at the damned mini mart. With all kinds of stupid stuff like spirit talisman magnets and anti demon wards. Grabbed one off the shelf at random and looked at the company logo on the back side. PL Promotions Company Inc. For these last two months since we'd gotten back from Heavenly Host, it seemed like there was a real spiritual boom going on all over the world. Whenever there'd been a strange death or something, the public would be all over it, downright excited about the possibility that it might be supernatural in nature. It was all over the TV shows and magazines too, with independent researchers checking out spiritual hotspots and giving fancy new age advice to people just to boost ratings or sales. And now this, exorcism merchandise, next to prepackaged cupcakes and ready-made dinners. The item I was examining happened to be one of the spirit talisman magnets, seemingly the last one in stock. No way, so I reached around me from behind and yanked it right out of my hands. She glowered at me for a moment before taking her prize over to the register. I just stood there staring blankly at her as she walked away. Okay, let's see here. Maybe it's his thing I was thinking of. It's a withered bouquet of flowers. Oh yeah, I heard there was a serial killer who recently done in a middle school girl around here. They were probably left in memory for her or something. It's pretty messy. Oh my gosh, that girl we talked to earlier was a ghost. So yeah, I just want to go home, I think. And okay, so this way. Now I think with him there is a candle we can save at, maybe. I don't know. It's actually a really chilly night. I could see Shinozaki's breath dissipating around her chin in, in short, frequent bursts. My room was on the second floor of the apartment building. Hadn't been expecting guests, but... I had just tidied up for my own sake a little while back, so it was fairly presentable. Shinozaki immediately sat down on my bed and began sipping the tea I'd made for her. She was holding it in both hands, probably less for politeness and more just to warm them up. Some of the large truck driving might seem to catch her off guard. She was clearly a bit jittery. Not surprising, all things considered. Time passed us by at a snail's pace. She looks like he continued to sip her tea, never once removing either hand from the warm cup. She definitely had something on her mind. Something had happened. It was written all over her face. She 
seems like he was in my room. I dreamed about this before, but never thought it would actually happen. Have acting as it really. This wasn't entirely unexpected. She was lucky, okay, maybe. A lot of things, but unpredictable is not among them. Took out the Ever After Stone on Stone for Michael. Tried to be as strong and commanding as I could possibly muster. I need her to realize what a bad idea this was. She had that thonograph thing from Iko with her and was pointing to the little girl's left arm. Didn't have to look very hard to see it, but... argue with that. There were so many assumptions being made, but she was so sure of herself. So certain that this would work. She wasn't about to listen to reason. She was like, he shook her head furiously, like some sort of violent shudder. It almost seemed like she was trying to shake something loose from her mind. She still had deep scars all along her arms, legs, and neck. Anyone can tell at a glance that she just recovered from a serious accident. She sounded so self-assured, so self-confident, but it was hard to take any of that seriously. This was the first time in my life I'd find myself tearing up over someone and not being embarrassed that I was crying. Honestly, it surprised even me how deeply I cared about Shinozaki and how much I just didn't want to lose her. My eyes were getting hot and glazed and I felt utterly helpless. was that I completely lost my words. I found myself weary scratching my head trying to come up with a good answer. This was Shinozaki and she had come to me for moral support, for encouragement, for peace of mind. It was really the first time she'd ever truly relied on me, ever truly counted on me. I knew then what I had to do.
Kirasaki and I stared into each other's eyes for a moment. Each of us trying to figure the other out. Try to force a smile. Shinosaki had basically curled up into a ball at this point. Tiny body collapsed in on itself for support, but now all of a sudden she unfurled um, herself and glared at me. Couldn't tell if she was mad or happy or what. Her eyes were either like daggers or saucers. I couldn't really make out which. Maybe she'd come here expecting me to actively shoot her down her ideas or something. Maybe she thought she'd be alone in this. Maybe she'd figure out what I was up to. Maybe she'd been expecting me to say exactly what I said to her and maybe it annoyed her? <laughs> Either way, tears began to explode from her eyes so quickly that red bags were forming under them almost instantly. She then turned her back to me, all with one single unconscious spin of her body. She seemed like she was trying her hardest not to let herself cry, though it wasn't exactly working. She paused, seemingly waiting for me to answer, but I had no idea what to say, and I absolutely didn't want to say the wrong thing, so I just stood there like a dolt. Finally, she turned back to face me, her tears mostly dry. Still a little self-conscious about crying, though, she kept her eyes closed. A telltale frown belying her confidence. There was obviously something between the lines for me to read here, but hell if I knew what it was. Shinosaki removed the Ever After stone from her pocket and placed it in squarely in my hand. I positioned it next to my stone and stared intently at the two. This was the turning point. What I did next could decide our fates. Couldn't mess this up. Outside my window, I could still hear the sound of construction vehicles driving by. It was now or never. And I closed on solid motion as I could manage. I opened my window and chucked the two stones out into the road. I timed it perfectly and my aim couldn't have been better. Another truck was just about to pass by and the stones were immediately in its path. The sound I heard next was a satisfying crunch. The sound of a delicate glass life box breaking into tiny pieces. Shinosaki had rushed over to the window and directly witnessed the fate of the Ever After stones. As soon as the truck drove over them, she collapsed to her knees. Fish my sister for sure. Saki's palm slammed in my face with a crab of force. The last speck of flesh of flesh echoed throughout the room. Side of my face was immediately in pain. I began rubbing it with my hand. It's a like, oh, you, you, you fucked up. It's filled with tears and her nose was running. She was breathing so heavily her shoulders were bobbing up and down. She was actually hysterical with rage. If I turn to fire back now, I was certain I'd done the right thing. <laughs> Damn! Let me move those hurt for where she was lucky then push past me, ran out of my room, crying like a child the whole way. Stood back up again, rubbing my cheek where I'd been slapped.
Uh oh. Oh God. So I was trying to Argus Cube. Back in the school that has fucked us up so many damn times. See, this is why you should have listened to Yoshiki. Oh boy, here we go again. There's a safe candle here somewhere. Was it this dark last time? Uh. There wasn't a clock like that in here last time either. I guess things really are different now. Oh, it's oh, has it gone too far? I don't even know his phone number. I should leave a message for him. Anyway, please. Oh. Good enough. Think now. Let's see if I can put. There's my candle! Ha ha! <laughs> well, now I'm gonna double save. Okay, so we're gonna end it here, even though we just got in the Heavenly Host, but this is an hour, over hour long video because I forgot how the beginning is so long. Like I said, it's been a while since I played this game. But anyways, I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys!